All right, let me go ahead and introduce our first speaker. I'm very, very honored that Matthew Leonard is here with us today. He is an international speaker, author, podcaster, and founder of The Science of Sainthood, a powerful online teaching platform focused on systematic spiritual formation for regular Catholics. He's an accomplished filmmaker. He's written, produced, directed, and hosted multiple best-selling series, which have been translated into about a dozen languages and broadcast around the world. Matthew is a former missionary. He's a convert to Catholicism and appears regularly on radio and television programs across the country. And he has, uh, his own popular podcast is called The Art of Catholic. It's listened to by many, many people around the world. Matthew holds a master's in theology from Franciscan University of Steubenville. He lives in Ohio with his wife, Veronica, and their six children. And he can be found online at scienceofsainthood.com. Would you please give a very, very warm welcome to our first speaker, Matthew Leonard. Good morning, guys. It is great to be with Catholic men. Uh, it's doubly sweet for me to be with you guys this morning because I'm a native of Dallas. Uh, I live outside of Pittsburgh now, and I'm so sick of black and gold I could puke. So I'm really happy to be here with you guys. Amen. But I'm even more excited because I'm here to talk about the Catholic faith. And this last Easter was my 25th anniversary into the Catholic Church, greatest 25 years of my life. And what I want to remind you today, and what this conference is really all about, is the fact that our Catholic faith at the end of the day is really all there is. And the Catholic faith is a beautiful piece of art, really. And it's art that is something that's gorgeous to behold, like this parish. Everything's big in Texas, I forgot, right? But it's also art in the sense that it's something that needs to be practiced. So that's what I want to do. I want to fire you up and remind you that at the end of the day, this is all there is. A few years ago, I was standing in front of my television and I was kind of going through channel like a rabbit on speed, like men are wont to do. And I came across one of those silly entertainment shows, you know, the ones that focus ridiculous amounts of attention on celebrities. Normally, I keep going, right, because I'm looking for the game. This time, I stopped. And the reason why is because the person who was being interviewed was none other than Andy Griffith. Now, how many of y'all remember the Andy Griffith show? How many of you guys watched it in prime time? <laughs> you guys are old, man. <laughs> I watched it like the black and white TV reruns when we had three channels. Remember those days? But when, even when you saw it in the black and white on my 13-inch TV, you knew Andy was this kind of Christian guy. I knew him to be this wholesome role model. He wasn't afraid to talk about his faith, even in Hollywood. And to my mind, success in any way, shape, or form, he deserved all the attention he was going to get which is why what he said stopped me cold. Now, the occasion for the interview was his 80th birthday. And after listing all of his career achievements and whatnot, the interviewer said, Mr. Griffith, if there's one thing you could change about your life, what would it be? And he said, without skipping a beat, everything. I was like, what? And the interviewer was like, what? You know, my own voice. Because normally when you're interviewing a guy on TV and you're like, oh, well, he's like, I wouldn't change anything because all these things made me who I am, right? And you're interviewing me on TV for crying out loud. But here was a guy who had garnered money, fame, and respect from every quarter. And given the opportunity, he said he would change everything. And echoing my own voice, the interviewer said, well, why? And he said, as a Christian man in the twilight of my life, I know that there was a lot more I could have done for my Lord. And as crazy as it sounds, this kind of celebrity gossip show was a watershed moment in my life because it made me, his statement instantly challenged all of my priorities. It made me have a fear of one day having regrets when I stand in front of my Lord and wasted the precious time that he'd given me on this earth. And just so you know, I wasn't a bad guy. I was doing my best as a husband and father to take care of my family, mass every day, I was teaching a Bible study at my local parish for crying out loud. Like, isn't that enough? No. As I've come to understand, it's not even close to enough. I don't normally quote French poetry, but French poet Leon Bois nailed it. He said, life holds only one tragedy, ultimately not to have been a saint. I want you to think about that for a second, because as Catholics, Saints are kind of like a cliche for us, right? They're so commonplace to us now. But we have to realize 
that they lived lives that involved way more than the highlight reels that we read about in those saint books that are sitting on our kids' shelves. And you gotta love those books, right? Because they make every saint sound like they're superhuman. Kind of like the, the guy from those Dos Equis commercials from a few years ago. Most interesting man in the world. He was so holy, his guardian angel asked him for protection, you know? <laughs> Stay holy, my friends. <laughs> every saint book has a beautiful woman. Like every woman saint's the most beautiful woman in the world, but she gave it all up to be a nun, you know, and all that. And there are beautiful holy Catholic women. I married one for sure. Everybody in here, if you're married, you married up, more than likely. But, and I'm not making fun of saints, you know, don't get me wrong, because in my own often very pathetic way, I'm trying to be one. But I do think that we tend to think of the saints as kind of a different species than the rest of us. Like they used to be normal guys until they were, you know, bitten by that radioactive holiness spider. Now they're kind of clinging to the side of church walls, looking down on the rest of us. And while we view them sometimes this way, you don't want to undermine the supernatural value of their lives either. Because these guys relied on supernatural grace to get them through. Realize they struggle with the same things that you struggle with, that I struggle with. Except for Our Lady, saints are made. They're not born. How many of y'all ever heard of St. Augustine, as I used to call him as a Protestant? St. Augustine. You should, because he's on the bracelet that you're wearing on your wrist right now. Bishop, doctor of the church. Like, if you're going to give top five guys in Western civilization, Augustine's on that list. He's quoted more times than anybody else in the catechism of the Catholic Church outside of the biblical authors. And yet here was a guy, you guys know that St. Augustine was a teenage dad? He had a kid when he was 17 years old, lived with his mistress for 17 more years after that, and plunged into what he himself described as a whirlpool of shameful deeds. It was years before he recognized the vanity and the emptiness of his ways. Even when the Lord was starting to draw him in, you know what Augustine prayed? Grant me chastity and continence, but not yet. You think he can't identify with modern culture? Of course he, said he can, right? In his book Confessions, he says that he is still beset by temptation, and the only thing that gets him through is the grace of Almighty God. And that's the thing with the saints. They're regular human beings who sought superhuman grace so as to overcome their frailties. Like these guys wanted to be holy more than anything else. St. Francis of Assisi, we're in his church. You know what he would do when his passions were under attack? Go throw himself in the snow. St. Benedict, he'd go roll around in the thorns. When would you do that? When did I do that? Mother Teresa would give a speech of the United Nations and have the entire world hanging on every word, then she'd go back into the convent and clean toilets just so pride wouldn't take root. And many of them face greater obstacles than you and I ever will. Right, it's kind of going this direction in the United States, but when was the last time you were thrown into a coliseum with a lion? Like an armed gladiator of some kind. But they prevailed, and we can too. Their lives are proof positive of St. Paul's admonition that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But we need that strength. That's part of the beauty of this brotherhood of this conference. And on one hand, look, I can get it. I, you know, I've been Catholic a long time now. I'm supposed to become a saint. But on the other hand, it's like, really? The thought of my face, like this mug on one of those laminated holy cards, is ludicrous. But that's the goal, right? Other people have done it. You and I are supposed to do it too. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 48, be perfect even as your heavenly Father is perfect. And maybe you're thinking, man, Jesus, do you know me? Have you seen me? Do you know who I'm descended from? And I think he does. This is why he came, right? This is why Jesus did everything that we just celebrated in Easter, that we're still celebrating this season of Easter. And Jesus says, with God, all things are possible. The whole point of his, his incarnation, death, and resurrection is so that you and I can spend an eternity in heaven communing with the saints. I hear a ring. Do you want me to turn this mic off? Are you good with that? I don't want to annoy anybody in the crowd any more than I already am. 
You good? Am I good? All right. Good. Now, perfection. Jesus says be perfect. Total perfection is not going to take place, guys, until we are finally united with God on the other side, right? In heaven, in glory. But you also have to realize that eternity is not something that just begins later. It starts right now, right? Everybody in this church is an immortal being with an eternal destiny. You don't get two lives to live, one life to live. How many of y'all were baptized? You know what it did? Poured supernatural grace inside of your life, inside of your soul. But that was just the beginning. That was the beginning of a process of perfection that, that, that takes place in fulfillment when we're united with our Lord. But realize, you grow up in your spiritual life in the same way that you grow up in your natural life. You move from spiritual infancy into spiritual adolescence and spiritual adulthood. The problem is too many of us are hanging out in spiritual infancy. We need to get serious about our spiritual lives. And that growth process toward perfection that Jesus calls us to can really only happen through the grace of God. You can't blink your eye without the grace of God empowering you. But even though God's grace is at the foundation of everything, we have a job. We've got a role. Our role is to get rid of anything and everything in our lives that would keep the grace of God from having its maximum impact on our lives. That's goal number one. Get holy. But here's the kicker. It's not enough for us just to get holy. We have a responsibility as Catholic men to help other people to heights of holiness as well. Again, this is one of the beautiful things about conferences like this. But this is how we fulfill the whole law that Jesus laid down for us. You love God and you love your neighbor as what? Yourself. Isn't that interesting? Because we love ourselves, don't we? When was the last time you were able to walk by a mirror without checking yourself out? Like, how you doing, you know? I used to go like this, but it doesn't matter anymore, right? <laughs> But we love ourselves enough to order the food that's going to satisfy us. We, we buy the clothes that are going to satisfy us, look good on us, right? Jesus knows this. And so he says, I want you to love other people as much as you love yourself. So we glorify him in our own lives, and we help lead other people to him as well. Because at the end of the day, you know what the church is? It's a family. There's a reason why this is called the brothers, right? Catholic brothers. The church is one big family. This truth was really driven home to me on the night that I was received into the Catholic faith. Again, 25 years ago, I was sitting like right there in the field house at Franciscan University of Steubenville. And years of prayer and study and even tears had come down to that night. And I couldn't believe that I was about to pull the trigger and become a Catholic, right? I thought all y'all were going to hell for the longest time. No joke, right? But, uh, and, and frankly, coming from a very Protestant family, and my dad's a pastor, uh, my move toward the church caused upheaval, not just in my life, but in the lives of my family and friends, and most of them just could not fathom why it is that I was going to become a papist. And regardless, a little bit of my family, my sister and brother-in-law, and my best friend and his fiance drove eight hours from Chicago to Steubenville just to be there. They did not agree with what I was doing at all. They came purely out of love for me, and I'm eternally grateful for that. But by the time the liturgy was over, they were so upset that they went and they got their unopened suitcases, they put them back in the car, and they took off for Chicago at midnight. I still remember those headlights, or those taillights going off into the, the distance. It was tough, right? But as painful as that estrangement from my, my family was, when it finally came time for me to receive our Lord in the Eucharist, I couldn't wait. In fact, my sponsor sitting next to me, and he said I literally elbowed him out of the way so that I could be firm. And I said, listen, even if I gave you the forearm shiver, can you, you blame me? I was about to encounter God in a radically new way. It was incredible. And after I received our Lord, and I kind of floated back to my seat, thanking God for all the things he had done in my life to drag me sometimes kicking and screaming into the arms of Holy Mother Church, I started looking at all the people who were going past me. And that's when it dawned on me that these people, most of whom I would never meet, had become part of my family, or I had become part of their family in a way that transcended blood relations. 
Like, no one's ever going to replace my mom and my dad or my siblings. But through the sacraments, I had been incorporated into their family in a real way. And it was awesome. And it dawned on me in that moment, it's like, this is kind of the biggest family reunion that I've ever been a part of. Now, when you're a member of the family, guys, you know there's responsibility that comes with it. You got kids and you send them out. What do you say? Take care of your brother. Take care of your sister. It's the same thing with us. As I said before, you and I have a responsibility not just to get ourselves in union with Jesus Christ, but to help other people do it as well. That's part of being a, a Catholic. That's part of, part of being a saint. And we have to realize that the stakes of this life are far too high for us to not embrace a radical holiness, a kind of extreme Catholicism in the eyes of the world. St. John Paul II said we must beg God assiduously to raise up saints. Why? Because saints are game changers. Let's be honest. The game's in need of change. You notice that? We got some problems. Everybody's so busy with this, that, and the other. We're consumed with the created things around us instead of our creator. I'm just as guilty as everybody else. There's some cool stuff in this world that God gave us. Even he said it was very good, you know, back in the beginning. The problem is that the world all too often has our full attention. Like there's no room for anything else in our lives. And the fact is, we got to start seeing the world differently. We have to start understanding the spiritual dimension that's going on right around us, right now, in this church. You know, back in the 90s, you guys remember the movies, the, the trilogy, The Matrix? Remember that opening scene when the first one where there's the encounter between Morpheus and Neo, the two main characters? And Morpheus offers Neo the choice between two pills. You can take the blue pill, which will send you back into a bland, meaningless existence that's full of distraction but will never satisfy you. Or you could take the red pill, which will open your eyes to the reality behind the curtain. Well, Jesus doesn't offer himself to us in a pill. He gives himself to us in the Eucharist, the medicine of immortality that unveils this world and pierces the darkness and gives us a kind of a, a 3D second sight. It's like, it's like spiritual glasses you put on that, that show you with greater reality what's going on in this world. It's greater clarity, greater depth. It's not that this world isn't real. It's that this world is more real than we realize. And we are missing something if we stay at this two-dimensional level. we got to put on our glory glasses so that we can see that the beauty of this world, as great as it is, is just a foreshadow. It's a hint of what it is that God has for us, for anyone who's willing to turn their eyes up toward heaven above. The problem is we're looking everywhere but up. I think this is the problem that we have in the Catholic Church and Christianity in general. Right? The, the things of God just are really not at the top of our lists. Our passions lay up there. If I say Notre Dame, most of us think football, right? Me too. Instead of Our Lady. Are you kidding me? How, how, how did this happen, right? Have you thought about this? The, the church I went to growing up, Protestant, we had like 200 people in my church. There are more than a billion people in the Catholic Church. How in the world did we lose our place as the primary influencer on the rest of the world? How did that happen? It's crazy because somehow all of these people we kind of like ceded our responsibility. What's crazy about it too is we've ceded it all to people who've never experienced the breathtaking grace, truth, and beauty of Jesus Christ. They're stuck in the mire of sin. And they're the ones who are dictating the agendas. They're the ones who are setting, you know, where culture goes. The majority of the world's being led by the spiritually dead on a path to destruction. They're not even turning around and giving us a second glance. I find that problematic. I think a big part of the problem is, guys, as Catholics, we tend to blend in more than stand out. We look like everybody else. We talk like everybody else. We live like everybody else. What is there about our lives that's going to get somebody to turn, take notice, and follow us? And I'm not talking about like making a display of yourself, like a distraction, like, look at that freak. That's not what I mean. 
It's not difference for difference's sake. I'm talking about living a saintly life that cannot be ignored. And if you're thinking to yourself right now, you're like, man, did he just say saintly again? Because, Matt, I got a hard enough time being good, much less like one of those guys in the same books you talk about. And if that's how you're, what you're thinking, like, welcome to my world. I'm there. But we have to remember that the saints, they lived in this world. They dealt with the same things that we do. They just weren't of this world. As I look out at this crowd, some of you guys were probably old enough to remember A Man for All Seasons. How many of you saw that? How many of you saw that in the theater? <laughs> Sweet Moses. <laughs> I saw it on a videotape, which basically dates me anyway. My six-year-old daughter one time picked up a, a cassette that was laying on the arm of the couch, and she looked at it like it was an archaeological artifact. And she goes, Daddy, what's a vahus? I was like... It's VHS, sweetie. Like, go to your room, right? <laughs> but A Man for All Seasons is about St. Thomas More, 16th century Englishman who literally lost his head because he wouldn't side with the king against the pope. Maybe you're thinking, that's kind of hardcore. Lost his head over politics? But if you took St. Thomas More and you put him in a police lineup, you wouldn't be able to peg him as the super holy guy. He was probably just like a lot of other guys that you know. Guy was well-educated, happily married, he had a great job, Lord High Chancellor of England. Looks pretty good on a resume. But while he looked like everybody else, he was different than everybody else because he lived every aspect of his life to a holy, higher standard. Do you know that St. Thomas More was an attorney? Let me say that again. St. Thomas More was an attorney. And guys, come on, right? I know there are attorneys in here. Right? I know there are some holy attorneys, right? <laughs> but we can learn from him. He was firmly rooted in this world, right? He worked his job. He engaged culture. He lived out his vocation the best way he knew how. And by doing that, he became this blinking sign that just said Jesus. He wasn't a mystic. He didn't have any extraordinary spiritual gifts. He just lived out his vocation. And the world couldn't help but notice him. They made a movie about him for crying out loud. See, this is the key, guys, because I know that everybody in here has somebody in their life who has left the faith in one way, shape, or another. And we're, you know, we're always leaving books on the coffee tables for them to read and tell them about this and that. Go watch this video. Here's the key. Holiness is the bonfire that draws people in from the cold, dark night of sin. You get holy and you will corner. Look, we have the market corner. Do you realize that? Everybody is made for what we've got. Everybody's got a Catholic-shaped hole in them, even if they don't know it. But that's the foundation of our faith. Our lives are supposed to radiate the grace and the truth and the beauty of Jesus Christ. That's what this life is all about. Holiness is how we get ourselves and others to heaven. And you do want to go to heaven, right? Do you? But have you ever stepped back and thought about that? Like everything we do, there's a goal in this life. And every decision we make, everything we do is ordered to our final end. It's ordered to heaven above. That's what it's all about. At the end of the day, what else is there? And we have the ability to make this happen. We have so much given to us as Catholics. People will come up to me, like all three of us here today, Father Calloway, Dr. Anders, we're all converts. And, and people are like, oh, converts, you guys are great, right? Like, oh, you got zeal for the faith, you were raised with the Bible, all that. I'm like, guys, I didn't get the Eucharist until I was 29 years old. Catholics have had it handed to them on a silver platter or a gold patent, right? Whichever one you want to say. But we've had it all. And don't forget this, guys, you cradle Catholics out there. You're the most blessed people on the face of the planet. And to whom much is given, much will be required. We have to know our faith and we have to live it. And again, we have the ability, we got all the graces. We have the sacraments, particularly the sacrament of sacraments, the, the Eucharist. We have the intercession of the saints. We have Our Lady. We got all this going on to get us to heaven and everybody else around us. The question is, are we ready? Are we ready to leave it all out on the field, as my football coach used to say in college? He also said things like, I want you to hit them so hard the snot flies out of their nose, right? It was never a visual I resonated with. He had rhetorical shortcomings. But his first question is legit. Are we ready to leave it all out on the field and come out the other end in a manner that we were made to be? 
Saints. And of course, you know, a lot of the, the question then becomes like, well, how do I become a saint? Like, what do I do? And this is a big part of what I've dedicated my life to. Like, once you discover the interior life of Catholicism, nothing else matters anymore. I found it something called the Science of Sainthood four years ago. It's basically a series, of, it's an online platform with a series of systematic videos that teach regular Catholics how to become saints. Because it's a process, guys. I ripped the name Science of Sainthood off from St. Augustine. I find it apropos. He's on your bracelets today. There's a process we got to go through. We got to know what it is. Jesus Christ says it's the one thing necessary. In fact, if you, guys, if you can throw that image up real quick, I got some free stuff. We all have books and stuff in the back. Come visit us, right? Here's something free for you. Pull out your phone and text that. You'll get a free video series. Totally, I'm not going to ask for a credit card or anything like that. It just expires. It goes away. But if you can get access to that for a couple of weeks for free and start your path toward it. It will start to teach you what the Catholic life is really all about interiorly because you're made for something beyond your wildest dreams. But this is what I've dedicated my life toward because this is what's transformed my life. And so for the next few minutes of what I have left in this talk, I just want to share three really practical things to help you move towards sainthood right now. And this won't just change your life for all eternity. It's going to transform your life right now, guaranteed. Number one, you have to learn how to love. You're like, oh, he's starting with the mushy stuff. There's an aspect of mushiness to love. You should have seen me when I first met my wife. I was like silly putty. But truth be told, true love is nitty gritty. True love is self-sacrifice. You don't believe me? You look at a crucifix. And, and this one's kind of clean. Look at a Latin American crucifix with the blood coming down. Sangre de Cristo, right? True self-gift, death to self. That's what it's all about. True love is when you come home from, tired, or from work dead tired and you go take the baby away from your wife because she's had it. Baby's been crying all day long. Or maybe it's your grandkids and you'll get them and you give your, your son and your daughter-in-law a break. True love demands that we put our wives on a pedestal. True love demands we put our children's and other people's desires and needs in front of our own. And yeah, we all know a man's called to be the head of the family. Leadership is something that's naturally given to us by God. But as most of us figured out a long time ago, we're not intrinsically superior to women. We're not. Right? Are we different? Yes, we are. Don't listen to what modern culture tells you. It's a bunch of horse hockey. Like we're all the same. We're not iPhones. You can swap a different body onto your soul. This transgender stuff, you know what it misses? It misses the fact that we are a union of body and soul. This is the fundamental problem of all of this. They don't realize that we are a union of body and soul. You know what it's called when you, you separate a body and soul? It's called death. We are a union of body and soul. But men and women are made to complement each other. We're made to give of ourselves to each other. And power and pride should never be the force behind our leadership. And to be honest, a lot of us need to be reminded of this. If anyone could have ruled by sheer power, it's Jesus. Think about it. He was God. And he teaches us this. This is why Jesus was Jewish and not Italian, right? Imagine if he was Italian. What? You got a problem. I know people, right? But, but why is it sometimes there's tension between men and women? It's because we don't love appropriately. True love is sacrificial. St. John of the Cross says true love creates equality because each is seeking to put the other first. And this isn't just a truism in marriage, it's a truism in every relationship because it comes from God. Have you ever sat back and wondered how is it that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all three persons and equal? It's because each one of them gives of themselves to the other, so one isn't greater than the other. So true love, sacrificial. And we love God and others starting with our family. We have to give of ourselves to them, okay? Number two, the sacraments. It's a no-brainer. I don't even know why I have to mention this, but there's a giant gold box over there. God is inside. The God of the universe. Now think about that for a second. The God of the universe who made you, who holds your very being in existence, is in this church and every other Catholic church. And every day in this parish and parishes all over the world, God makes himself available to us. And I don't want a show of hands, but how many of us make ourselves available to him on a regular basis? And I know, listen, we're busy. We get it, right? Oh, man, I'm busy. I got work. 
I got my family, got money in that football. Life is demanding. On the other hand, raise your hand if you've ever been in love. Raise your hand. I don't mean with a gun or a car. I mean a flesh and blood woman, right? <laughs> you might have married that woman. When you're in love with somebody, you want to be with them 24-7, right? When I first started dating my wife, I was in Chicago, she was in Steubenville, and after a 50-hour work week, I would drive eight hours on the most boring road in all of America, I-80, across Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio, just to spend a day and a half looking into her chocolatey browns. Right? And I'm betting you guys have done similar things. Remember when you used to stay up and watch romantic comedies with her? You watch Anne of Green Gables for crying out loud. Knowing you got to get up early the next day and maybe tell your buddies what it is you did the night before. But you were in love. You were willing to make sacrifices for her in the relationship. That's what God is after in our own lives. He wants us to make him the priority in our life. And when I think it's too hard for me to get to a daily mass, you know what I do? I think about or I look at a crucifix. Jesus was beaten to a bloody pulp and died for me. What am I willing to do for him? And it's not about guilt or making you feel bad. It's about love. Without the grace that Jesus Christ offers us, particularly in the Eucharist, you can't be the Catholic man that you were designed to be. You need to make it primary. Get the confession. It's available to you today. And then you get the daily Mass as often as you possibly can. Make it primary in your life. Jesus wants to give you everything he's got, which is all there is, because what he gives you is himself. And realize what that means. He's not just getting ready to go to heaven. God gives you something beyond your wildest dreams. 2 Peter 1.4 says, you become a partaker in the divine nature of God. St. Athanasius said, God became man so that man might become God. You're never going to get a better offer than that. We don't become equal to him, but through grace we become what he is by nature. It's incredible. You literally become divine. That's not heresy. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Catechism says the only begotten Son of God, wanting to make us shares in his divinity, assumed our nature so that he made man might make men gods. That's his gift to you. That's what he wants to give you on this altar. Get the Mass as often as you possibly can. What do you receive? The body, blood, soul, and what? Divinity of Almighty God. That's the public secret of the Catholic faith. That's why there should be 10,000 people here. We should be preaching this from the rooftop, guys. That's what it's all ordered to. You get the Mass as often as you possibly can because it is an incredible gift that God is offering us. But realize, too, that the sacraments won't do you any real good unless you have number three, which is a life of prayer. And this is probably the hardest one because prayer means slowing down and shutting up. If you don't have a life of prayer, realize you're not talking to the person who loves you more than anybody else. You have to have, and there's an art to prayer. The catechism says it's not enough to have the will to pray. There is an art to it. You have to have the will to do it and learn how to do it. We've got to know how to pray. And it's so important because this is where you tell the Lord what's going on in your life. You make your needs known to him. You know, we talk about personal relationships with the Lord. Prayer is the relationship with our Lord. If you don't have a life of prayer, you've got no relationship with him. But you know why you've got to pray? Because literally it's what you're made for. If our final union is with God in heaven above, and prayer is how we enter into that relationship now, you better be doing it right now, every day. You've got to make time and realize there are different modes that you've got to go through in your life of prayer. Vocal, meditative, and contemplative prayer. Those aren't just for mystics. It's not just for monks and nuns living on the hinterland. That's what God has for every single one of us in here. He wants to raise you up into his life. It doesn't matter what your vocation or state in life is, but you enter into that life through, pay, through prayer. You're like, oh, Matt, I, I learned all the prayers as a Catholic growing up. I pray a memorare before every Cowboys game. I'm like, good, because they need it, right? About the last 20 years for crying out loud. Apparently, our prayers aren't enough. But even if you're, you're doing your memorabilities and your rosaries and your litanies and such, don't let them become mechanical. They've got to come from your heart. You've got to think about what it is that you are saying. Jesus said, don't babble like the pagans. But whether or not you're reciting these prayers that you grew up with, which are beautiful, right? I pray a rosary every day. I pray a Divine Mercy Chaplet every day. Say the prayers of the church. They unite us as a family. Do them. But even if you're doing those, or whether or not you're making stuff up on the fly, 
because you're a convert and you're used to doing that, make sure they come from your heart, right? Tell the Lord what's going on in your life. I got a book back in the back called Prayer Works that goes through the different kinds of prayer. If you don't get my book, go get somebody else's book. Do something to engage your life of prayer. If you're not doing it, if you don't have a life of prayer, you got to start now. St. Alphonsus Liguori says, he's quoting, basically paraphrasing uh, St. Teresa of Avila, and he says, if you don't have a regular life of meditative prayer, meaning every day, you don't need demons to carry you to hell. You carry yourself there in your own hands. So we have to have a regular life. Take 15 minutes. If you've never done it before, take 15 minutes and set it aside for God today, starting today. And let me just challenge you. Take two weeks and do this in your life. It will be hard. I guarantee you it will be hard. You would rather go out in the August heat in Dallas and dig a ditch than spend 15 minutes alone with our Lord if you've never done it. But the more you do it, the faster it goes. And that prayer time starts going by. And you know why? Because it's literally what you're made for. This kind of interior relationship with God. We, have, we spend all kinds of time working on our our physical health, right? How much time do we spend working on our interior lives, which is the only one that's going to matter at the end of the day? But if you get to the sacraments, right, and you develop this life of prayer, your life is going to change. It will. This is where you get the power to love like Jesus Christ, to live like Jesus Christ, and encounter him for all eternity. The things of this world are great, guys, but they're a shadow of what it is that God has waiting for you. You know what St. Paul says everything in this world compared to Jesus Christ is? He calls it scubula. You know what that is? It's a four-letter word in English that starts with an S that you don't want your kids to say. Did St. Paul said that? Yeah, he did. Everything else compared to what God has for you is scubula. You got a nice house? Wood, tile, and bricks. Scubula. Your F-150, your 250, your 350, it's scubula, all right? Your 50-inch Vizio, scubula. I mean, live in this world, enjoy it, but don't let it be your end. Don't let it consume you because Jesus gave himself to die for you so that you might have opportunity for life with him for all eternity. Again, eye has not seen or or ear heard nor the heart of man conceived what what God has prepared for those who love him. You've got to learn how to love him. And this conference today is going to stoke the fires, but you've got to make an act of the will And decide that you're going to be the holy Catholic man that God designed you to be so that you can get yourself and others to him for all eternity. Because time is short. You do not want to get to the end of your life, whenever that might be, and have regrets that you didn't spend enough time with our Lord in prayer, that you didn't get to Mass as often as you possibly could, that you didn't do everything in your power to get yourself, your friends, and even your enemies to life eternal in Jesus Christ. Because this is it. There are no second chances. Life holds only one tragedy. Ultimately, not to have been a saint. And again, Jesus is waiting to give it all to you. Open your arms. Receive him. Tell the Lord you're ready. Let's tell him right now. Are you ready? Again, are you ready? Don't cut any corners because time is short. You give yourself to the God who made you, who loves you, and offers you an eternity with him that blows everything else away. Let's be saints together. Amen? Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you.